Will you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We are going to be uh, in 1 Timothy, as I've, I've mentioned. And we're going to pick up in chapter 1, verse 15, through to the end of the chapter. I invite you to now hear the Word of the living God. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Here ends the reading of God's Word. Amen. Father, thank you for your Word. Would you teach us by it today? Transform us by it. Renew our hearts and minds by it, we pray in Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. So last week, as you all know, I was out of town, and uh, thanks for all the people that have asked about it. I, I went skiing, and as you can tell, I'm still a whole person, no broken anythings. Um, had a, I got more um, daring as the week went on, uh, and, and you know, towards the end, there were a couple times I'd look down and go, how am I getting down from here? So I did what any good man in his 40s would do, slid on my rear end down the hill until I got to a good spot. Um, and so uh, safety is not always in uh, doing the proper skiing methods. Um, as we go through Timothy, you know that uh, this is Paul's fatherly counsel. That's the title of the sermon series, A Father's Counsel, uh, Nurturing the Church. So when we go and talk about church leadership, we come to Timothy, we come to Titus, because he's saying, hey, Timothy, here's how you need to set the church up. Here's how you need to organize it. Timothy had been sent to Ephesus, a great city of Ephesus, very important city in the Roman kingdom, uh, Roman Empire. And uh, the, the letter here is, you can just sense Paul's heart for the church, for the Lord, and for Timothy. And today, uh, this section, what he's really crying out to Timothy is, hey, Timothy, don't just rest on the fact that you put faith in Jesus, but foster it. And as a leader in the church, we're setting up an an organization. People don't like that word. Oh, it needs to be inorganic or it needs to be organic. And these people come up, they don't like the words we use to describe the church as too too much of an entity and organ. I don't care what you call it. He's saying, Timothy, put a focus on gathering a group of people and organizing it in a biblical way that will grow their faith in God. Because faith needs to be nurtured. It needs to be encouraged. So we come to verse 15. And he says, Timothy, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Now, before we get to the saying, we just read it and hint it's Jesus is the Savior of the world. But before we get there, what's Paul trying to drive home? He says, look, Timothy, this is based on my experience. If you remember Paul's experience, he, he, he came, on, he was on the road to Damascus. He had letters to go capture Christians, throw them in jail, persecute them, prosecute them, um, bring them to, to death if necessary, to drive them away from the living God, Jesus Christ. And God struck him blind. Now, we all know, there's, I've, you've heard me talk recently, of, there's all of a sudden one day when you pick up that little medicine bottle and you can't read it anymore, 
and you, you're doing this, and you go, man, it feels like it was overnight that my eyesight just went. And people older than you go, oh, you've got to get these glasses. And you've got to, there's always, you know, we all experience this. And the young people are going, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've got 2010 vision. I can see everything. Your day's coming. <laughs> and people older than me going, Rick, you just wait. Because sin is driving us and, and, and hurting us. But Paul's experience was not that. It was not this weakening of the eyes. It was an instantaneous moment. In a moment, he was cast blind and he knew. He says, Timothy, my experience is very clear. That was God. And I heard the voice, I heard Jesus, I met Jesus on the road. So what I'm telling you, Timothy, is that this is trustworthy, it is true, it is, it is deserving of full acceptance based off of my experience. And so I would ask you today just to reflect on this as you leave today. What does your experience reveal? You go, well, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Do you reflect on God? Do you see the events of your life as a work of God in your life and in the world? Or are they just random events that we're navigating and trying to get through in order to reach an end goal, which is heaven? That latter is not the correct. What the correct way is, God is moving and orchestrating, what does it say? All things together together. For the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. God is working in your life. And the thing that happened to Paul is his eyes, the scales were removed. And, and that's this, this imagery of God spiritually awakening Paul. And not only did Paul go, I love Jesus. He went, I now see every single thing in my life as an orchestration of God to the building of his kingdom, to the gathering of his sheep, and to the eradication of sin. And this was my part, Timothy. And what I'm telling you is from my experience, what I've seen, the spirit living inside of me, this saying is trustworthy and it is true that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I met him. He spoke to me. I know this is true. And I urge you to embrace it with the very depths of your soul. And oh, by the way, he came to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. So Paul here, St. Timothy, Jesus is the only Savior. So don't ever mistake that. There will be numerous and a plethora of people, of churches even, that, call, that fly under the banner, they call themselves churches, that will tell you, that there are multiple ways to God. There are many expressions of the true God in religions of, across the world. That's what the that's that's this ecumenism that the world wants to portray. Because shouldn't we all get along? We're all one globe. Shouldn't we live together and get along? And surely God has revealed Himself to different people at different times in different ways. And Paul says, "No, Jesus is the only Savior." He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, um, who did he come to save? Let me, let me read this a different way. Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. You put the emphasis on a different word, and you go, oh, he came to save sinners. Are you a sinner? Everybody's like, yeah, we've been through this. I know I'm a sinner. Would you please quit talking about that? I don't want to talk about the fact that we're sinners. What I want to talk about the fact is that he came to save you. Because sin can start to weigh us down. Scripture says you are a sinner. And Scripture also has a truth that is worth living by. Jesus came to save you. That is what we, we tend to forget as Christians. That Jesus has wiped away and washed clean because we want to be holy. We want to, we want to walk in newness of life. We want to walk away from the evils of this world, the, the, the sins that plague us, and we can get so focused on them that we begin to start thinking of ourselves in the context of our sin. And God says, I've forgiven that. Turn your eyes to Christ. Turn your eyes to the forgiveness that Jesus has given. He came, he, he, Jesus himself said, you don't go to the doctor when you're not sick. The, the healthy and the well have no need of a physician. Only those who are sick. So the healthy and, and sinless have no need of a Savior. He says, I point out your sin 
so that you you realize you have a need so that you will come and be healed. And I want you reflecting on the fact that you were healed. And Paul said, "I, I am the foremost of sinners, but me as, and he's not going, I was pretty good at sin. It's not like, uh, You've been around those groups. I've even been caught up in this where um, you start talking about your olden days and you start bragging and you realize you're bragging about your sins. Um, it's not what Paul's doing here. He said he received mercy from Jesus Christ. And, and, he, and he, what he's trying to say is, look, I was the chief of sinners and I'm, doing, I'm telling you this because I want you to realize I received mercy that in me as the foremost, the most prominent, the, the, the best sinner, because I'm pretty sure none of you have chased around and killed Christians. He says, I received that mercy that Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to you and to me, to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. There's, there's two sides a lot of times to, to, to this, this story, to this picture. There are those who just see no need for a savior. Practically, I don't need a savior. And, he's, and, and Paul says, look, here, here's an, my life is an example that we all need a Savior. I was doing the most righteous and holy thing I thought I could do. And I needed a Savior. So there's an example for them. And then there's the other side of those who fear they're not within God's reach. If that's you today, Paul says, you got nothing on me. I'm way worse than you ever would be. And God saved me. Now, is Paul saying that there's no sins worse than him ever? No, I'd, I'd say rounding up Jews and putting them in camps and putting them in, in, in incinerating them in fires, and that's probably worse. Paul's not trying to say that I've done the worst than anybody in all of creation would ever do. He's trying to really paint this picture that there's no limit to God's grace other than obviously blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But he's trying to explain to us that your sin, don't wait to become perfect to come to Christ. Come to Christ and be cleansed of your sin. And that's what Paul is, is driving home to Timothy. And, and then here's the interesting thing, though. Paul sees the positive side of his sin. And you go, hold up. The whole time I've been at this church, there was no positive side to sin. Sin was evil. Sin was wicked. Sin was death. Sin was blah, blah, blah. You can, what is the, how could there be a positive side to sin? And, and Paul says, God used my sin for your good. I'm an example to you that you can follow. You repent, you can receive grace too. I promise you I've received it. I've turned, I've repented, I no longer am going to chase down Christians. I've joined the ranks of Christianity and I'm the foremost prominent leader among all the Gentiles. And not only did I receive the grace to, to inch my way cautiously into heaven, I, that's not what I received. He said, I was thrust from the most evil and wicked in the, in the kingdom of Christ to a prominent leader in a position and authority to take the gospel to places it would never be dreamed of being taken, to the Gentiles. Oh, that was, I, I have been privileged. And Paul says, look at that. Look at the example God didn't just save me by the skin of my teeth. He exalted me. He is glorifying me, putting me in, a, in an amazing position to do glorious things for him. His horrendous transgressions, they were not only beyond God's reach, but they were not beyond God using him in the kingdom to do fabulous and amazing. How, how amazing were the things that Paul did? We're 2,000 years later still talking about the man. Still using him as an example. God was gracious to Paul. So what does Paul do? He pens a letter. And in the middle of this letter, the Spirit so grips him. He, he's, I, I, it doesn't tell us he's in tears, but I could almost picture him in tears. Just thinking about what God had done for him. Just, just writing to his son about it, knowing that his days on this earth are coming to an end soon in the next few years, whatever it was, knowing that he was, he was passing on this legacy, the next generation to Timothy, reflecting on all that had happened. 
And he says, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Exclamation point. I don't think there was an exclamation point in the Hebrew language. But he was overwhelmed with praise to God. You go, man, that was great, Paul. Thanks for the letter. He said, I'm not done. That was just me exploding with praise to God because I reflected on my sin and I saw the grace I had been given. So it resulted in doxology. And I, I had no other choice but to write of praise to God. Paul's own sin moved his eyes to God's glory. So another question for you today to reflect on. Do your eyes dwell on your own sin? Or do you spend more time meditating and thinking on the forgiveness that was granted by God to you? Paul would point you towards forgiveness. Paul would point you towards grace. Paul would point you to reflect on what God has done for you. This time of corporate worship. This is intended to draw our minds to what? To the fountain of grace. God called us to worship. We responded. How did we respond? Through confession of sin. A heart that's renewed by the Spirit. A heart that's indwelt by the Spirit. A heart that's controlled by the Spirit. When he sees the living God, falls down in confession. But did God leave us there saying, good, you deserve that. Stay on the ground. No. The very next moment, there's this assurance that comes from Scripture. You see, worship is said to be a dialogue between the people of God and God. Not between me and God. I simply get to stand up here and, and have the privilege of leading you in this. But it's a dialogue. God calls, we respond, we praise, and we confess our sin. When we confess our sin, He responds with, with the assurance of forgiveness. We go, oh, hallelujah, you've forgiven me. Uh, that reminds me of I need to give my life to you with tithes and offerings. And then we, it's a constant back and forth, back and forth. And our confession is met with assurance of forgiveness. And so Paul says to the king of ages, oh, how glorious he is. Because he's reflecting on what it is that we're reflecting on today. The glory and grace of God. So in this doxology, when he talks about the king of ages, what he's trying to get across and what, where his mind is going, he says, Jesus Christ that I met on the road to Damascus, he's not limited to a single century of time. He's not limited. He's the king of ages. Paul would deny the cries of, of, that scripture are antiquated. You ever heard somebody talk in that way? That, or maybe we're New Testament Christians, not Old Testament Christians. People try to get around scripture being the only rule of, the, of faith and practice in their lives. Paul would say, no, it's not antiquated. I would call it maybe ageless. I would call it ancient, an ancient truth that is so valuable that it has not been altered or transformed or overwritten or, or proved false or anything. And, and what he's saying is, look, he's the king of ages. Do you know how I know he's the king of ages, Timothy? Because I met him. And when did I meet him? After his death. He spoke to me after his death. Therefore, he is immortal. That word immortal, it qualifies that word ages as unending all ages. He's not just the king of a few ages. He's the king of all the ages, of all time. Death is the only way to ensure defeat of an enemy. Because until someone's dead, there's always the opportunity for them to rise up. Don't believe me? Go watch one of the movies out there. Every movie. You're like, oh, where did he come from? I thought he was gone. Um, those old kung fu movies, you ever seen those where their lips are off and their voices? The guy's dead and down. All of a sudden, he comes back up and beats him up and, and wins. That's the, that's the story we love to see. The guy that's down and out comes back and miraculously wins. Until one is defeated, is dead, death, defeat cannot be guaranteed. And Paul is looking at Timothy through his pen. Saying, Jesus is not defeated. Jesus is alive and well. Jesus is immortal. He cannot be defeated. Oh, and by the way, he's invisible. Timothy's reading this going, yeah, I knew that, but Paul, who'd you meet on the road to Damascus? 
He's, he's invisible. You see, it's, it's been said that faith is a, is a leap of faith into the unknown. It's not really true. Faith is not a leap into something that's unknown. It's an experience of the unseen. It's, it's hope and trust in that which you don't see. But we, when we have eyes to see, Paul said, I saw Jesus. He said, I experienced him. I heard his voice. Paul became convinced that Jesus was the man, visible manifestation of the invisible God. You can't see God. We, we ask our children the catechism question, can you see God? No, he, but he sees me. What is God? God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body like me. Well, Jesus Christ took on flesh to reveal God in a very special and amazing way. And Paul became convinced that Jesus was God. Many today would say, you know, if Jesus would just reveal himself to me, if I could just see him, how about if I talk to him, if I could see that water turn to wine, I could see some miraculous things, I would believe. I, I would, I really would. I would follow him. I would trust him. I just, I just find it hard to, I, you know, science, it's not, it's not tangible. I, I can't, I can't touch it. I just don't believe it's there. Well, here's what um, the 16th chapter of Luke has to say about that. Beginning in verse 19, the 16th chapter of Luke, we have these stories, we have a series of parables, and we have a series of stories, and this is the rich man and Lazarus. In verse 16, he said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Well, the rich man also died and was buried. And then Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and said, I saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have, have mercy on me and, and send Lazarus to just to dip the end of his finger in water and just cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. We might say he had his best life now. And Lazarus, in like manner, had things, um, uh, had bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses they have the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Jesus is trying to explain that faith is faith in the unseen but it's, it's not faith in something that we haven't experienced it says open your eyes the spirit of god opened the eyes of paul and this opened him to understand that the voice he heard was from jesus he was blinded he heard a voice he knew it was jesus the people around him heard the voice their eyes were still open they didn't see a person the spirit of the living god said this is Jesus speaking to you on the road to Damascus. He is invisible, immortal, the king of the ages, the only God. He is unique in every way, the only God. No other rivals to his majesty, there are none, as revealed in the grace that is shown to Paul. There is we're called to meditate each day on the kindness that God has shown us because that is where freedom is found because he is the only God, the only one able to show us grace. There's no other rivals to, to that majestic, majestic, glorious grace. And then he ends it with honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
the close of this doxology, the close of this, this praise, the heart of a man that has been touched by God's grace. This doxology, this, this heart of praise, every day waking with joy, is the man that every Christian woman wants leading their home. It's the woman that every Christian man wants to call wife. The heart that is bent toward God in praise. The God of Scripture. Amen and amen. He bounces out of this doxology. He says, Timothy, i got a charge for you. I want to entrust you with this. You know, there have been prophecies about you that have been previously made about you. They've called you to this role. And what I want to entrust you to do is that you may wage the good warfare. You may have heard fight the good fight. You see, what he's trying to get across to Timothy is, apart from faith, people who don't believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, all things and all people are going to fight against anything that praises God. Not just let it neutrally stand by. And it may be a long-term battle, but they will fight tooth and nail to stop the praise of God. This idea and this word wage the good warfare, it's a military term in, in the Greek. Um, and it's this idea of being a soldier on behalf of righteousness. You see, what he's trying to get across here is that passive Christianity going, yeah, I prayed a prayer when I was a kid and I go to church every so often. And um, he says passive Christianity is a dangerous endeavor. It's like walking into a war zone. Maybe a Korea and Vietnam are the, the wars that you remember most. Or maybe Iraq and Afghanistan are the ones that... It's, it's that war that you, you... The first war you encounter, you're like, that's the one you remember your whole life. Um, maybe for you, it wasn't Iraq and Afghanistan. Maybe the first one you were aware of was Ukraine and Russia and the Gaza Strip and Israel. But whatever war there is, could you imagine walking into a war zone... Uh, missiles flying, drones overhead, uh, guns, being, depending on the age of war of which you're in. And you walk out there, no armory, no armor, no anything, no weapons. You're just walking in like you're going into the grocery store. Everybody go, what you, what you, who would do that? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? Why would you walk into a war zone unprepared for war? And Paul says, Timothy, be prepared. Don't walk into this blind and ignorant of what's actually going on. Open your eyes to see. Because what Paul saw is both sides of the coin. He didn't all of a sudden forget when his eyes were open, forget what his heart was like beforehand. He knew that what was working out of him in him before Christ opened his eyes was the spirit of Antichrist. And he was trying to explain to Timothy. I would have stopped at nothing to kill you. And there are many, many, many people like that out there. But we've grown up in America. Christian overtones, Christian society, the morals and judicial system have had Christian influence. And we go, surely, surely that's not the way it is. And we're looking at our government today and going, I don't think they like us. I'm not sure. But surely they wouldn't step over this line. Surely they wouldn't do this. Surely they wouldn't call, make it where we can't work, get fired. Surely they wouldn't. And we can keep saying surely they wouldn't. And Paul is saying it's war. It's war. And the way you prepare for it is not to go get your legal argument ready. It's not to take up guns and swords. It's to take up the sword of Scripture and make sure it is in your heart. And be prepared to walk through whatever comes your way. Paul's life was probably easier before he became a Christian. He was at the top of the game, man. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. Well educated. People were like, yeah, man, get rid of those Christians. They're causing all the problems. People were cheering him on. People were exalting him in great positions. And next thing he knows, he's fleeing for his life, being beaten, being thrown out of the city, being thrown in jail. Life shortened. Paul wasn't miserable afterwards. He's trying to explain to Timothy, you will be attacked, be prepared. To fight the good fight. How? 
holding faith in a good conscience. This is a call to active participation and continuing to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul here forbids our kind of modern way of Christian faith. You say a prayer and profess faith as a child, then you kind of leave it behind as you age. Just don't worry about it too much. And as you get out of your parents' home, you move into college, you're like, I'm a Christian. Church is kind of in the way. My buddies are going out on Sundays. I'm tired. It's from Saturday night, Friday night, hanging out. And you begin to form this pattern. And then historically, people have kids. They're like, oh, no, i got to get them back. They're little rascals, and they're running around crazy. I need to get them. Oh, the church is good. I'll get them there. That's kind of how society has gone. And Paul says, man, y'all have got it all wrong. He says, that faith you prayed, that, that hope and that you put in Christ as a little child, maybe you were sprinkled as a, as a communicant, uh, as, as an infant, or maybe you were, you were baptized as a as a someone who put faith in Christ at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever age it was in your 20s. He says that was the beginning of your faith and walk in Christ. And you've got to continue it and you've got to work at it and you've got to strive towards it. Paul also forbids this idea of once saved, always saved. Now you go, hold up, Pastor. What about perseverance of the saints? Hallelujah. There are two different things in my mind, doctrinally. Perseverance of the saints says. God is going to work in you to make sure that you don't fall short of the kingdom. He's going to and give you the gifts and strength to persevere in faith. Once saved, always saved kind of gives you this mentality of, man, I was saved one time, doesn't matter what I do now. Now, proponents of the doctrine wouldn't say that necessarily, but that's kind of where it naturally can lend to, that you can be saved without renewal in Christ's likeness. You see, here's what happens. Children grow up in, the, in a community of faith, in a community of family, a community of Christianity, and then Satan's toolkit of distractions comes flying at them, and it drives them away from holiness, from God, and they don't even recognize it and don't even see it. And then they get up to all of our ages, and they're far from the Lord and don't know how to return. Church leaders must be able to discern error in their own doctrine and life. Church members must also. You must hold to faith, hold to a good conscience. And he's saying, fight the good fight to cling to these things. Well, pastor, what do I do to do that? This community, the church family and community, the word of God, the sermons preached, the sacraments, these are God's means and methods of sustaining faith and service in that community, not just showing up and watching everybody but actively participating and promoting the kingdom of God. But he says, by rejecting these things, this good conscience, this, this faith, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. You see, Christ is sort of presented as the ark. You remember Noah's ark and the ark of the covenant? And Noah's ark was built to ride them to safety. Could you imagine the utter chaos that would have ensued if that ark had hit a reef? started sinking, animals going everywhere, birds flying around, Noah running for his life. It would have been mass chaos. Noah had to build the ship, had to take care of the animals, had to, to, to prepare for the, the, the work that was coming. Had he been a little shoddy in his work and didn't really follow God's plan, what if the ship just fell apart through the, through the waves? Christ is our ark. The ark of God cannot wreck. But what if you jumped off? What if you decided this ark's not for me? What if you got on the ark that wasn't God's ark? All of these things can create chaos in the life of a, of a human. And he says, what Paul is trying to get across here is that, you know, they made a shipwreck of their faith. Saving faith is spiritually disciplined. Saving faith is, is purposeful. And according to God's design, it looks at all the things that God has laid out, the praise of God, the church of God, the worship of God, the scriptures of God, the prayers of the saints. It looks at those and goes, those are God's ways of bringing me to the end of giving me perseverance. I'm going to purposefully dig deeply into those things, to dive into them, to grow in them. And he looks at Timothy with his pen, says, Timothy, I want you to model this before the other leaders. 
I want you to, to demand it from your leaders, that they be spiritually disciplined people that are leading the church to be spiritually disciplined saints for the good of the saints. This both assures that they're riding on the right ark. <laughs> you know, if, if, if someone's not spiritually disciplined, you go, well, why not? Are you in the wrong place? But it also reveals the wolves, those who are just in here because it kind of feels right, but I'm not really caring about my faith. Verse 20 concludes it. Among those that have made a shipwreck of their faith, Hymenaeus and uh, Alexander, I've handed them over to Satan. Paul begins here to give a glimpse of church discipline at work. First thing is the action, handed them over to Satan. He said, you are no longer a part of God's church. As an apostle, he was making this statement to say, you are not living the life that is a, of a Christian. He pronounced them outside the bounds of the church. They were unwelcome without repentance. Paul would always say, repent and return and you're welcomed. You see, love doesn't demand acceptance. Love demands the truth of God's word being delivered with gentleness and kindness and acceptance of repentance. So that was the action, handed them over to, the, to Satan. He said, but what was the purpose of that? That they may learn. Church discipline and handing people over to Satan, removing them from the roster of the roles. But one of the, one of the aspects of the church and the body of Christ is to help you see when you're walking in sin, to call you to repentance. Faithful men and women respond to discipline with repentance, not with flight. So if you feel the Spirit of God pulling you today, respond with repentance. So, what do we take from this? Christian, we ought to work to foster our faith. We're in war. And I don't expect that to be something you never thought of, something you never heard. You've, always, you've all heard about spiritual warfare. We know, it's, we know we're at war. Um, but it's good to hear it reiterated. It's good to hear Paul see it written down. Um, think about a seaman who is out on, on, a, on a boat. Um, Consider one who ventured out unprepared, thrashed by the mighty sea, thrown overboard. Why aren't we afraid of the sea today? We go out and get on cruise ships, and we don't really think anything about it. We're not concerned about sinking. About We're not concerned about major storms. It's not because the sea is less dangerous. It's because we prepared. We now have ships that we can withstand much greater things. We now have uh, weather satellites that can help us navigate around. We prepared for the dangers of the sea. And so now we can go out and enjoy the sea. Christian faith is navigating through a storm. How fitting is it that it's raining today? Christian faith is walking through this, navigating around with the eyesight of God. Are you prepared for the battle? Timothy was called to prepare the church for the battle that was coming. And what's his evidence of success? I think it's captured in that doxology. The evidence of Timothy's success was that the saints desiring a life of praise to God. So I ask you this question. Is your life more filled with complaint or with praise? More whining or whispers of praise thank you thank you perhaps it's past time to take up the whole armor of god that you might stand firm as paul says against the flaming darts of the evil one the one who seeks your praise satan would love nothing more than to have you praising his name and following him trusting him he seeks your life Jesus seeks to give you life. So I'll close with this. Elders of the church, remember, you share the charge of Timothy. Foster the faith of the saints and set their eyes on glory. And then the call for us is to model before them a life of constant praise.
Let's pray. Father, how glorious and majestic and beautiful you are. We see it in the moments of forgiveness that come to us. The opportunity that we have to forgive and we realize what you have done for us, God, result in praise. And so we ask this morning, God, as we leave this place, that you would help us to be a people that praises you for every moment of every day. The good things, the bad things, the sicknesses, the, the joys. Help us to be people of praise, recognizing that all things are in your hand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.